This is Join Us in France, episode 320. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and today I bring you a conversation with Sarah Smith about moving to the Mayenne and the reasons why she fell in love with that part of France. Do you even know where the Mayenne is? Probably not, but don't feel badly. There are lots of French people who would be so sure either. The Mayenne is one of those quiet gems in France that are off the beaten track and yet so full of charm. Sarah will tell us about those gems and how her move to France went. Thank you, patrons, for giving me a precious gift, the time to produce this podcast. By becoming a patron, you join the team of folks who love France and want to hear all about it because it makes them happy. And there will be a shout out to new patrons after the interview. A big thank you also to all of you who buy my cookbook, join us at the table and my voice map tours of Paris or make purchases through my Amazon affiliate links and spread the word about this podcast. Please visit joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique to see all of that good stuff. Show notes and guest notes for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com for slash 320, the numeral, where you can see a recap of what Sarah and I discussed, as well as links to relevant resources. Follow Addicted to Friends on Instagram to see the beautiful photos of the Mayenne that Sarah shared with me and all of us. And the best way to stay in touch with me and with this podcast is to sign up for the newsletter letter at joinusinfrance.com forward slash newsletter. Bonjour, Sarah, and welcome to Join Us in France. Hi, Annie. Bonjour à tous. How, how nice to talk to you all the way from the Mayenne, a beautiful part of France that we don't talk about enough. So, uh, as a matter of fact, I don't think we've ever really talked about it on this podcast. And whose fault is that? Hmm? <laughs> well, you know, most people don't talk about the Mayenne. It's kind of a hidden secret. So that's yeah. um, no one's fault. So you, you moved there a few years ago and you've had wonderful experiences, wonderful adventures there. So I want to hear all about it. Super. Well, um, yes, I am speaking to you from the Mayenne, and because it is unknown, I will share with you that we're in the northwest area of France. It's um, part of the Pays de la Loire, and it's tucked a little wedge tucked between Normandy and Brittany. We're about 90 minutes by train from Paris. If I drive three hours south, I'm in the Loire Valley with all the chateaux, two and a half hours north, and we're at the Normandy beaches. And I kind of need to be clear because kind of like in America, there's multiple places named Mississippi. There's a lot of Mayenne. Ah, so the, yes. the Mayenne is a department. There is a city within Mayenne called Mayenne. And there is also a river that flows through the region, which is the Mayenne. Uh -huh. So we're going to talk about the region and mostly the river. And I'll let other people actually talk about Mayenne, the town. Okay. So... Okay, cool. If we're okay with this, what I'll do is I'll just sort of start, you know, um, we can talk about how we chose France and ultimately the Mayenne, uh, some of the lifestyle differences, the joys of living in France. I won't get into the actual home buying process because you've already done that on a podcast. <laughs> and uh, we'll also talk about travel because I know this is about travel. Yeah, Sound good. that's great. Okay, super. Um, for a little bit of background, I am currently 62 years old. And in our mid-50s, my husband and I began seeing obituaries for people that were not that much older than us, mm. like David Bowie, 69, Gary yeah. Shandling, 66, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if we only have 15 years left to live, how do we want to spend them? And uh, we had traveled a lot. I've been to six continents, but I've always loved Europe. And so there we were. It was the second week of November 2016. And we decided, what the heck are we waiting for? <laughs> and you can yeah, 
time that however you want to. But uh, in the next 12 months, <laughs> we talked about where to retire. We did our research. We readied our home for sale. And we began a deep purge of most of our stuff. Mm. And, um, you know, I mentioned that we always loved Europe. And Europe's pretty big. And we're getting older. So one of the first things I started looking at was how long does it take to become a permanent resident in a country? Ah, yes, that's a good question, actually. Yeah, you know, the clock is ticking for us. So in France... For everybody, dear. (laughs) You know, when I was 30, (laughs) I didn't feel that way. Well, yes, but (laughs) still. Uh, In France, it's only five years. Same thing with Portugal and same thing with Ireland. And I think it's also the same thing with the United Kingdom. But, you know, when Brexit came up, they eliminated themselves because we wanted to be in Europe. So... um, you know, we'd been to France. It's beautiful. Uh, Portugal's a little too warm for us. And Ireland's not in continental Europe. And so we decided to go for France. Wow. Yeah. It's and very, next- it's very uh, Cartesian. It's a very, you know, like you sat down and made your list. <laughs> well, you know, it's a big move, Annie, to it is. kiss it all behind and go to a country, particularly, you know, we didn't speak French. So one of the first things we started doing was getting French lessons at Alliance Francaise. Mm-hmm. And uh, I grew up speaking Spanish, so I speak horrible French with a bad Spanish accent. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> But in the next 12 months, we basically sold everything, applied for our long-stay visas. But we're not really good nomads. And France is actually the largest country in Western Europe. So... Mm-hmm. We knew we didn't want to be bouncing around forever, and we couldn't explore the entire country. So we had to figure out some way to focus in on an area. So in that year, I would sit up in bed at night and look at at maps or look at uh, listings of homes for sale. And we knew a price range that felt good to us. But I would take um, Google Maps, and you know you can make your own custom maps there, and I would plot out where these houses were that looked comfortable to us. And then we would read all the many articles about moving to France. And we had friends that were French that were living in America. And we'd talk to them about their ideas of things. (laughs) And then that same year, the French election happened. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was Le Pen versus Macron. Yeah. And we knew we weren't Le Pen people, so we kind of overlaid the map of all the houses we'd found and where Le Pen was winning, and that focused us over to the west side of France. Right, right. Yeah, Le Pen uh, has a huge follower, amount of followers in the, nor- in the very north of France and mm-hmm. around Provence uh, and all around the Mediterranean. I'm kind of surprised about around Provence. Why is that, man? Uh, it, it's probably because there are a lot of older people, retirees that move there, and they tend to be more cr- conservative, you know. Okay. Uh, All uh, right. Bordering on crazy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's a podcast for you. Uh, well, we decided that we could handle three months, you know, living in jeeps and being nomads. So we narrowed it down to three areas that we were going to go to. And I thought it would be good if we started with an area that we knew a little bit because it was all going to be so different. So we had been to the, you know, we'd, I'd been to Paris a few times and I'd been to Provence. But uh, we started in the Dordogne and we chose uh, to work our way north from the Dordogne to the Loire and then to end up in Brittany. Cool. And um, yeah, with uh, I was working as a small business owner and I could work remotely. My husband elected to be, uh, he could have gone freelance, but he elected to retire. So with little more than a year after deciding to emigrate to Europe, we everything sold, visas in hand. We flew into Bordeaux. So, two- so just a second, to be clear, sure. so you did not apply for a working permit in France. What, what you were doing is you were operating your American business from France. Exactly. As a matter of fact, we had to sign an affidavit that we would not look for work in France. Right, right. Right. Yep. So we came, uh, yeah, we, we flew into Bordeaux and we had two giant duffel bags 
nine other pieces of luggage, suitcases and boxes of things. We rented, we spent a week in Bordeaux getting outfitted with things that I needed, like a scanner and a printer. And we had rented a jeet, not a jeet, but um, an SUV for six months, which we picked up in Bordeaux. Mm. And then after a week there, we headed out to the Dordogne mm. and rented a little house. And, you know, the Dordogne is beautiful. Yeah. It, sorry, I'm going to stop you again. Sure. The, so you sold a lot of your stuff. So did you decide yeah. to put some stuff in storage or did you really get rid of everything besides those nine pieces of luggage and two duffel bags? We sold darn near everything. Oh, wow. Yeah. What we kept was the art a few pieces of good furniture, but everything else we got rid of. Okay, so you, you do have a storage unit somewhere or a family or something that's keeping some stuff for you. That did, but that's all been shipped over since we bought our ah, house. Ah, ah, okay, okay. That yeah, makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, our big king-size American bed would eat up our bedroom here in France. Yes. I Actually, yeah. I shipped my ginormous American bed here and I told my sister, because my sister is the one who found our house when we made the move in 2005. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and uh, she, she, she um, I told her, I, I need a big bedroom, just the one big bedroom, because I have a big bed. And she was like, okay, she had seen my house in the US, so she could understand what I meant. And, and I do have a house with a big bedroom. <laughs> that, mm -hmm. was, I, that was not negotiable. My king size bed was coming along. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're we're cozying up in the equivalent of a, an American queen size bed in our room now. Which is all but, right, you know, too. We didn't want to pay for shipping and storage of things like an ironing board. You know, sure. so, I mean, we literally got rid of darn near everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, then, and that's so, a big question. When people think about moving, they always it's always the stuff like that that just gets you. You're like, can I do can I do without? Yeah. And uh, yes, you probably can. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I will say that my husband and I uh, both chose never to have children. And we've only been together as a couple for 13 years. So there was nobody to hand things down to. I mean, we were throwing out yearbooks and all sorts of memorabilia. It's like, yeah, we've we've moved that around. We don't need yeah. that anymore. Get rid of it. Lighten up. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Go. So tell me about the Dordogne. Okay. Sorry, I interrupted you. You were just to get into how beautiful the Dordogne is. Oh, I was going to be very brief on the Dordogne. Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> it is. It's very beautiful, but there are a lot of winding roads and steep hills, and we were getting older, so we didn't necessarily feel like that was the greatest fit for us. Okay. But bef and so from there, we then moved to the Loire. But I will tell you, before we left any region, and this is true with the Dordogne, we asked ourselves, if this is the region that we're going to, to ultimately choose, what part, what town do we want to sort of focus our life around? Because we would spend our days before I had to go to work driving and looking at the towns and the cities and things like that to get a sense. So we weren't there for sightseeing. We were there to to try to feel what it was going to be like for livability yeah. in a place. Yeah. Um, our next stop was the Loire Valley, which was beautiful. But we found it was rather flat, and it seemed like a long drive from some of the more attractive and affordable towns to the larger city centers where we might want to go and do our shopping. Okay. And, um, of course, it's lovely with all the, you know, the vineyards and things and the chateau, so it's a great place. But um, after a month in the Loire, we then had a gîte rental set up for Brittany. And uh, if you remember on in my intro, uh, the, the Mayenne is right next to Brittany. Yeah. And so on our way from the Loire to the Gite rental in Brittany, we passed through the Mayenne and we stopped for lunch in a lovely small riverside city called Laval. And that's spelled L-A-V-A-L. -A -A yep. Laval. And... You know, in the Mayenne, there there are no vineyards. It's mostly cows and it's dairy farming. Hmm. And there are lots of rivers here. This was an area that was mostly industrial with fat fabric mills and things like that. But so we stopped and we had lunch in Laval and then we went on to our sheet. And I kind of kept thinking about Laval. Hmm. 
But Arjit was in Brittany, and everyone had touted Brittany as a great destination for Anglophones. So while we were there for our month, we made certain to take a long weekend and drive around Brittany and spend a night in a few chosen towns. And again, just continuing to ask ourselves, you know, what does this feel like? How does this feel for a place to live? But I just kept thinking about Laval. Right. And we decided that that was what felt right and where we wanted to be. So if, if, you, if I may, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to talk briefly about Laval and what attracted us to it. And then I'll go more about the Mayenne in general. Okay. Is that okay? Very good. Okay, super. So um, I started by mentioning that Laval is 90 minutes by train from Paris. It's also an hour's drive from Le Mans. Or there's also another town called Rennes, which has got a university and an airport. Mm. The population, it's about 70,000 people in the city and its first ring suburbs. It's the home of the prefecture, which is where we have to go whenever we're doing anything for immigration. Uh, the, the downtown itself, it straddles the Mayenne River. It's got this wonderful walkable city center. And the Ministry of Culture and Communication has dubbed it a city of art and history, which means it's a town with a really rich heritage. Hmm. I know that, um, that Elise talks a lot about art with you. Uh, I don't know if you've discussed the painter Henri Rousseau. Oh, yeah, he's also... come up a few times, yes. Okay, well, this was his birthplace. Oh. He, was born, he was born in Laval, and um, his, he, he was considered part of a, a naive art movement, and there's a beautiful old 11th century castle that's up on a hill in Laval. It's perfectly restored, and it houses a free museum of naive arts from all around the world. Oh. Not far from the museum is a rather large park with rose gardens, a small zoo. It's up on the hilltop. You can overlook the valley and the city, the downtown. There's a, a Saturday market that's fantastic. Anybody that goes to the small Saturday markets around here, when I bring them into Laval, it's wonderful. It stretches for blocks mm -hmm. with people um, selling clothes and the fresh fruits and the vegetables and the fishmonger and the cheese shop and all the little restaurants and coves that surround this open square have got people there drinking and having coffee. And it's incredibly lively, of course, not during COVID, but, right. you know, when yeah. we're out of I yeah. hope I hope all these businesses will come back after after COVID is over. Uh, I hope so too. Actually, yeah. during during some of the confinement, we were able to open up part of the the market, um, but we had distancing that had right. to happen. Right, right. Yeah. A, a, yeah. Few, a few have continued, but people are just timid and and hesitant, and especially in a place like Laval, I assume that the population is not particularly young. It's actually quite mixed. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so there's a few universities here. There's oh, okay. A, yeah. Yep. Right. So um, it's and actually there's also a minority ethnic population that is here as well too. From um, fr uh, mostly it looks like from Northern Africa. Hmm. Cool. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And hospitals and all. Oh, it's it's a real city. <gasps> it's great. There's also um, you know there's a part of the town that that wasn't destroyed during the war. That's old winding roads and the half timber houses that are just absolutely charming. Yeah. And the I photos mentioned, look great. Oh oh yeah. I think you're going to include a website uh, to the Laval Center or to the Laval Tourism. Yeah. You know and. And along with all that charm, you know, there's a there's a high street or a, a main street that's filled with shops. And so when I go clothing shopping, that's where I like to go with big names and also local boutiques that are there. Uh, 90 minutes, as I mentioned already, to Paris by train. Um, the suburbs outside of Laval, which, again, the city center is just a beautiful little walking thing. If, when friends come to visit, I want to spend all Saturday in Laval. But outside of it are suburbs with fantastic shopping centers, um, big box stores, so you've got the livability that's there. If you're into World War II, uh, this area was occupied during you know, the war, and after the Allies landed in Normandy, they made their way to Laval, and it's from Laval where they plan their liberation of Paris. Hmm. Cool. You know, and 
And, you know, you, su you suggested, well, maybe there's a lot of old people there. There's actually a center for the development of vir uh, virtual reality. And so every year there's an annual conference for virtual reality with global attendance that happens here. <laughs> cool. There's there's a giant new sports center that's being built that is going to be part of the 2024 Paris Summer Olympics. The time trials for the 2021 Tour de France will be here. Um, it's also the home of a multinational food company, Lactose. Talus. So we've got history, we've got art, we've got commerce, we've got beauty and modern day livability. And it's all just on this wonderful human scale. That's cool. So, I'm sorry. I'm just like absolutely passionate. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, yeah. it's beautiful. France is full of these minor towns that are absolutely fantastic and, and not very well known. And, you know, I understand France has so much. It's hard to talk about it all. But but. It's wonderful that there are people like you who who are purposefully looking for these jewels. And, you know, we have been here. We've been around this area for about three years now. And I tell you, every time I go into Laval, which is easily two or three times a month, my little heart sings. At Christmas time, they're going to light the whole place will be lit up with an amazing light display that people will normally, not this year, but normally will drive for miles around to come and see that's up for several days. But, you know... The Mayenne itself, I mentioned in the south, the Dordogne is just, you know, beautiful with the rocky roads and the the valleys and things. And down in, in Loire, you have the wine country. And here in the Mayenne, it's a very subtle beauty. It's not a showstopper, but it's got gentle rolling hills, these river valleys, wide open skies. And I think that there is a real soulfulness to the land. You know, mm. it's got soul, it's got heart. Um, the people down south, they can't believe that we would be happy up here because it's known to be rainy and everyone likes the hot summer south. But the winters are mild. I come from Minnesota where it's just, oh, oh my yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. Not and here, the same. you know, we had one morning with snow in two years and it melted by noon. You're right. <laughs> um, it's I, I've never been to Washington State, but I hear there's a lot in common and in that we have a little bit of rain, a little sun and maybe a few clouds and it'll happen all in one day. Mm -hmm. And it's green and lush and there's something in bloom year round. It's absolutely like living in a garden. Mm. Um my husband, he uh, he said it's the, it's the best climate he's lived in, and he grew up in San Diego, Napa Valley, and Monterey, California. So, huh. you know, yeah, that's that says something. Cool. Uh, at uh, at night, uh, it's a really clear sky with big bright stars. Our little town is only 500 people, and so there's no boulangerie or anything, but 20 minutes away, we're in Laval, we're in the town of Mayenne, we're in another town called Ernay. They all have hospitals. We've got a, a banking town and a market town six minutes away, so... That's pretty close. It's very sweet. It's yeah, very sweet. Yeah, no, that's great, because sometimes I, I wonder about people who set up really far to me what really far is is if you're more than an hour away from a town then you know what are the chances that you're going to take the trip as often as you might be inclined to otherwise because it's mm -hmm. two hours in the car you know it's it's a long time but it is but if you're only you know under 15 minutes it's great and you know during this time of covid it's our house is in a vill it's in the village we have an actual nice yard of about i don't know half an acre which is unusual for a village home, but friends of ours that are out in country homes are feeling a bit isolated, particularly those that live alone. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Unfortunately, so, COVID has changed everything for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we'll be the, you know, vaccinated soon. Yeah. And yeah, you know, um, I will say as romantic and as wonderful as this all is, being an immigrant and immigrating is not for the faint of heart. You really have to have patience and perseverance in navigating the bureaucracy. And my husband and I don't subscribe to the romantic notion of being expats. We're immigrants. We <laughs> we get to stay here by the grace of the French government, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's true that a lot of it's true that expat and immigrants don't carry the same meaning, do they? I don't think they 
carry the same perception, but the reality is, is that's what we are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we may be white, we may be middle class, but we still have to follow all the rules mm -hmm. of being of an, of an immigrant. Yeah. So, so did you manage this move, the, all the practical side of it, by yourselves, or did you hire somebody to help with the move? Or, I mean, as far as a consultant or something like that. No, we um, before we came here, we did it all ourselves, uh, and after reading lots of things. Since we've been here, we have had some help with things like um, the annual. We have to go in annually to renew our carte de séjour, which is our card of stay, which is essentially our green card. Yep. And we have to present our banking information and everything there. And um, so we help. Our French is still not strong enough that we bring somebody with us to help translate with that and a few other things that uh, have been involved but other than that we've managed a lot of things ourselves and you know Annie it, there's things that you kind of hope would be simple are, are not necessarily like the chicken egg thing of uh, having a phone number and getting a bank account you can't get a phone number without a bank account and you can't get a bank account without a phone number yeah yeah so So you, so so the solution there is to use a friend's phone number or something but that that's why people end up hiring consultants is because then the consultant can just provide them with a temporary number you know that that they'll oh. change later yeah huh I didn't. Well, what we did is we went to one of the stores and got a temporary phone number from them. Then that gave us a number in France. Then when we were in the Loire, we went from bank to bank, like Mary and Joseph, begging each banker to please open up a bank account for us. That's hard, we isn't it? Very. We for Americans, a, it's hard. Very hard, yes. The gen we found a gentleman that was British, uh, and he really had to explain to his boss that no they don't want to launder money they just want to be able to you know have pay their electric bill and pay their phone bill here right right so we should explain why this is happening this is a uh, this is a uh, this happens because the american government decided that they wanted french banks or banks outside of the us to report all sorts of things about american citizens banks all over the world This they did this to catch thieves. Well, to catch tax cheats, mm -hmm. not thieves, tax cheats. But th the the problem is it puts a huge burden on French banks to actually report all this thing, all these things, and to jump through all these hoops. And so for for French banks, it's easier to turn you away and just say no, I'm not dealing with Americans. The requirements to report to the IRS are just apparently impossible. I don't know what, I, I, I don't know the details, but. And that's what I've been told too. And that really came home to roost when we were trying to get a mortgage for the house. We talked to um, some bankers and also uh, a mortgage broker here in town and then meaning Laval here in Laval. And then we also had read, you know, all those expat websites and and there were people that were touting themselves as specialists in helping getting expats and I'm using their term not my term expats mortgages and so we worked with one of them for a few months but they're actually gearing more towards the the British audience yeah. they were not able to do it so after four months of trying and we, we had to postpone this the final purchase of our house for one month while we did this we finally just had to pay cash right. which was a big surprise, but luckily things are, you know, fairly affordable. And then, you know, in our house, we are not handy. And so we did not come here with the romantic dream of buying a house and renovating it. The home that we bought was essentially fully renovated in 2006, but it's an old stone home. And the first part of it was built in the 1600s. There's a second part that's from the 1700s. And another part that's the 1800s. So part of our home is older than America. And, <laughs> you know, uh, people, we have friends here that come to renovate, you know, they buy houses that need renovations. And um, I shouldn't say, well, we've met them since they've arrived. And they've arrived from other countries. And the building processes and materials are different than their home country. So we have friends from Australia that it's like, whoa, they're renovating an old house, all very, very different. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, renovating a house in France is not for the faint of heart. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a great thing to do if you want to write a book. 
<laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> well, and I don't even know if it's a good thing to write a book because there's plenty of those out there already. There a lot so of those stiff out there. competition. Yeah, yeah. Yes, a lot of them. It, and you know, we're in we're in the English we're in the countryside, so finding help service providers, most of them don't speak any English. Right. So not knowing French is not helpful. And we've seen marriages that have ended when one spouse, spouse sorry, had the expectation that the other spouse would simply become handy and learn how to do everything, <laughs> you know, by looking at YouTube specials. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, yeah. no, no, yeah. no. Don't think like that. Yeah. No. So in the end, so how did you find your house? Because we, you talked about needing to pay for it cash, which doesn't surprise me. <laughs> but how did you find it? Well, um, you know, we knew the area that we wanted to be in. And the way it works in France, it's not like in America. In America, you pick one realtor and you work with them and they can show you lots of houses. It's not that way here. Um, usually, uh, someone that's selling a house will sign up with multiple realtors and you have to work with one of those realtors that that seller has chosen to represent their house. Well, we looked at a couple of different houses before this one with a couple of different realtors, immobiliers. And then we met one immobilier that we particularly felt comfortable with um, and uh, decided we wanted to work with him exclusively. But he didn't have every listing or every house available to him sure. that we wanted to see. So we worked out a deal that he was comfortable with that if we saw a house online, we and would partner with him to go find that house. Oh, and wow. <laughs> Well, you laugh because, you know, they don't put addresses here. No, they, they don't just, put addresses. And very often they don't even put up a sign that it's for sale. Exactly. They will tell you the name of the town, but that doesn't mean it's in the town. It right. might be out in the countryside. It's a really, so, per, it's a really silly. I was going to say stupid. <laughs> okay, it's both. It's, uh, it's, it, it's, it doesn't make any sense because they pit realtor against one another. And so what ends up happening is that if you're selling your house, you go talk to one realtor who says, oh, I can get 100000 from that for that house. And then the next day you go talk to another realtor who says, well, I can get $110,000 for that house. And so you, just, you pick your realtor very often based on how, how they sell you on how much they can get for your house. Well, and you can see the same house on five different real estate listings, maybe it five different prices, right. which is right. unusual. So what we did is we um, we would go off in the mornings and find the houses that were inter that we were interested in, if, and then um, we'd written up a letter in French and in English of introduction to uh, that our immobilier could bring or our realtor could bring to the owner of that home and say, "Hi, you know, I have these clients that sincerely are interested in buying your house, but they only want to work with me. May I show your home?" And sometimes it meant us going into the local mayor's office with a picture of the house and saying, "Excuse me." Do you know where this house is? Right, <laughs> and they and they would tell us. So, um, and that's exactly how we found the house that that we wound up buying. Wow! And so yeah. this works in rural areas, but in big cities it doesn't work because in big city they typically will show you a how you know a picture that's inside of the house. You have no idea what it, where it is outside. Right, that's a big secret because again, all of these realtors are working against one another instead of together to sell a house. And so you don't know where the house is. And mm -hmm. as a buyer, if I said to, to a realtor, I would like a house with four bedrooms and two bathrooms in this specific town. Most of the time, the realtor would say, oh, yes, I can show you that. Let's make an appointment. Let's meet in front of this cafe that time that day. Okay. I show up. And the guy has a house with four bedrooms and two bathrooms, but they're not in the right town. Oh. So why did you bring me here? Well, because that's what I have to show you. Huh. You see? So the realtors, they show you what they have rather than what you want. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. What, I, what took me a, a little bit of time to find out is when, you know, we, we were choosing mostly in little towns around um, Laval. Our town is called La Bigotier. And uh, when I w when the realtor would say, okay, I will meet you in La Bigotier or whatever the name of the town is, I would say, well, where in that town? Where do we meet? Well, the answer is simple. You just meet at the church because every town right. has a little church. And that's it took me a while to figure that out. So, <laughs> yeah. 
But uh, so here we are. We're living in our home. We we absolutely love it. And Annie, if you were to tell me that uh, for the first time since the 1970s, I am living in a home with no screens on the windows, <laughs> no air conditioning, no disposal, mm. I would think, wow, that's crazy. But that's <laughs> life in Europe. You know, that's it the way is. it goes. It is. So, so you can install screens. I have at my house. It took me mm -hmm. a, a whole week to find them, buy them, cut them to size, put them up. But I did it because I was sick and tired of, the f of having flies <laughs> come yeah. inside. And in, you know, in this intermediate season, which is rather long in France, where you turn off the heater and you don't need the AC, It's really nice to just be able to open your windows and not have bugs all over the house, you know. And yes. so, so I did it. But you, to, you don't find a lot of houses with screens already put in. You have to do it yourself. We actually put a screen on our master bedroom window so we could have that open. And there's um, a couple of, it's, it's almost like chicken wire that we pop into a couple windows at night mm -hmm. um, just to keep, the, the bugs don't seem to come through. But uh, one morning before we had that, I walked into the room that had the window open and I kind of looked up and there was a bat that had come in. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we decided we wanted to be able to have the windows open, but maybe keep the bats out. So, yeah, that, uh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a plus. Yeah. You know, uh, other things that are different too, like central heat is, un is not necessarily common. There's a lot of room heating. And as we rented these sheets from place to place to place, it, we got to use different types of heating systems and see what was something that we liked, mm -hmm. you know, or, or wanted in our home. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, um, and for, for the disposal, the issue is not that you cannot get a disposal because you can buy one and install it, but it's, It's frowned upon because it fills up the sewer system with particulates that French sewer systems are not designed to hand up to to handle all of these particulates. Oh, and that's interesting. Right. So our our plumber said, "Yes, I've seen them. I know Americans have them. I could get one for you, but I really discourage you from installing one because our sewer, the line." Well, I live on a private road, and mm -hmm. so t between our, our house to the street is a good, oh, I don't know, 150 meters. And he says, you're going to plug it up. Within a year or two, it'll be plugged up, and you'll have to do something about it. And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the other things that's new for us, too, is we have a gas stove, but we, you, we, fill, we use gas canisters like people uh, yeah. do for barbecues in America. Yeah. So, Although we have other friends that live in a city that have city gas. Sure. In a local. I had the same thing here with the gas canister. The, the first, when we first arrived, it was, we used the gas canister because we're about 150 meters away from the gas line. And yeah. it was a big expense to get it, you know, to get it, the trench done and installed. And I thought, well, we'll just do it with the canister. So I went, I, I upgraded to a high end induction stove, uh, stove top and it, works even better than gas in my opinion but you have to get the expensive ones if you get the cheaper ones they don't work so well no. anyway so yeah <laughs> okay. do you know if i may I'll, i'll probably dive in a little bit to some of the thing more about living in uh the mayan and then kind of hit some of the highlights of the areas around here cool is that okay yeah super So we've already talked about shopping, you know, there's the fresh air markets, there's modern supermarkets that are fantastic, you know, so that's easy enough to go to. Um, some of the other changes that we've had to get accustomed to, and I know that you guys have talked about this, is that everything's closed on Sundays. I, I say everything, but there are some little grocery stores that are open for a few hours in the morning. So if we're traveling that day, we know to stop at one of the few markets that's open, get picnic food for lunch because the restaurants will be closed out in the countryside. And there's no nonstop service in these restaurants. It's basically, you know, they and they stop service at two o'clock. If you haven't been seated by one o'clock, forget it. Yeah. And you oftentimes have to even make reservations, even if it's not a fancy place. But mm -hmm. the cost of living here Here, Annie. People talk about how expensive France is. That's BS, at least where we are. Um, those, those, we can go out for lunch, and for 15 euro, we get a nice three course lunch, including wine or cider. Tipping is optional, it's not gourmet, but it's delicious. Yeah. And I can go any day of the week. Um, 
I'm still dyeing my hair. I the, for the cost of what it cost me to get my hair colored in the states, my I get my hair colored and we get both of our haircuts done here for the same price. Wow. That's what it was there. Our I, property I pay 32 for a cut. Okay, I pay for for my haircut, my husband's haircut and my hair color which is uh with two sets of foils in it, it's about 110 uh, euro. Yeah, well, this is pretty reasonable. I paid $135 just for the color in the states. Oof. Yeah. And that wasn't a big fancy city. So, you know, um, our medical costs here are r ridiculously low. My, my husband had a, a medical a day surgery the other day, and uh, we had to pay 200 euro for that. It was 30 euro for a private room for him to recover in. And they decided to keep him two extra nights, and they didn't charge us anything extra. Wow. So a day surgery and two nights in a private room in a in a clinic was 230 euro. Yeah. I did check the prices in America and that would have cost us about $6,000 US. Wow. No, yeah. it's true that that for healthcare it's hard to beat. It is. It is. And our our property taxes are less than half they what, what they were in the United States. Hmm. So And then the roads here, oh, my God, they're just, we hated road trips in America. Here, they flow so easily. When we drew, when we went up to the Normandy beaches, it was a two and a half hour drive, and I think we had to stop six times, and that was it. And I mean, that's for stoplights or something. Wow. So, okay, uh, rapid fire, some places here in the Loire? Yes. That we'd want to come to? Okay, super. So you can assume... The Loire is very, again, it's, it's a, I'm sorry, the, the, the Mayenne is a very mellow kind of air, gentle area. So you can assume that these are all small, charming towns with at least one or two restaurants. Most have a river that runs through them. They're great places to visit, to meander the streets, and each one has its own feeling. So right next to us is a place called Cheyenne, and and I won't bother with the spelling because I uh, Annie, you're going to put this on yeah, your website. Yeah, it'll right? be on the show notes. Yes. Okay, and and please say this in French: the petite cities of character. What is that? Put, uh, I forgot. The petit village de caractère, or something like that. Petite cité de caractère. Cité de caractère. Okay, okay. Right. I'll, I'll look it up. Okay, and that's a that's a uh, uh, designation that charming little. So small cities get and you can use that to kind of pinpoint some places so that's right next to us there's a town called fontaine danielle that has a beautiful little lake on it and it used to be an area a factory town for fabrics because this was a milling area well actually they still make fabrics there and they are gorgeous and you can go buy beautiful fabrics and meander this darling little town Another one, Ambriere Le Vallée. There's a microbrewery. There's a weaving museum there. Um, this, the town of Lassay Le Chateau. It has three castles in it. One is privately owned, and you can visit that. Another one, you are castle ruins that you can hike about 10, 15 minutes out of the town and go see that. They have a rose garden with 300 varieties of roses. Mm, wow. Um, Just down the road from us is a tiny little village. I mean, it doesn't even have a boulangerie. It's called Montchiru, but it's on the Mayenne River. And for people that like to bike, the Mayenne is part of the Velo Franchette, which is a it's um, it's a it's a bike path that goes from the English Channel to the Atlantic Ocean. It's 372 miles long. And here there are these beautiful paths that run all along the riverbanks of the Mayenne. And you will bike there and you will see people hiking or doing rock climbing up the face of the wall. In this Montjuru, there is a fabulous chateau that sits up high on the river overlooking the banks. My husband and I will picnic uh, on the islands with the locks that are there hmm. um saint suzanne it's a hill town with an 11th century castle that you can go up and visit and it's the only one in the region that didn't fall to william the conqueror now i'm not a historian but it's a big place with people that are historians but again a gorgeous little town mm -hmm. um To the south of us is Kron, C-R-A-O-N. And it's got a, there's a large private chateau there that you can meander the grounds. And again, a beautiful town. 
Frenay sur Sarthe, another petite city of character, um, with a weaving town and picnic grounds inside of an old castle ruin. And then I have um, also in the Mayenne is a little town called Saint Pierre sur Erve, and it only has like maybe 400 inhabitants. But every summer, or ever for the past two or three summers, Artists take over the town for a couple of months, and they fill the streets with paintings on the ground, putting artworks up on the houses, sculptures on the bridge and and in the river or in the paths in the forest. They'll take over an old abandoned building and put a little art gallery in it. And, you know, go and have a picnic and meander the area. Yeah, it sounds really charming. It is, it is. And if there's like three more last stops, and then I'll just stop, okay? Are we good? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we are by Brittany in Normandy, so we do venture over there. In, in Normandy, there's saint senare le jere which is, again, winding river. It's an art town. And there is a small church with these gorgeous 12th and 14th century frescoes. But also along with that, there are sculptural reliefs that have been done of various phases, I believe, of Christ's life. And they're done by an artist who still lives in the town. He's 89 years old, and you can go visit his studio. And there are several other art studios there. Hmm. And lovely restaurants and gardens nearby. Again, tiny, tiny town, but just... You can spend hours, just, it's so beautiful. And Vitre, which is in uh, Norm- it's in uh, Normandy, I'm sorry, it's in Brittany. Vitre is in Brittany to the south of us. And that has an old 13th century castle. And you can meand, you get there by meandering these streets of half timber homes and restaurants. So it's a charming, romantic little place to discover some candlelit restaurant, you know, down an alley. How nice. So the list of all of these will be in the show notes. Uh, Absolutely. For this episode, because it, it, you went kind of fast, but there's a lot of beautiful little places to check out there. Absolutely. And if I'm just the one last one to mention, and that is the Parc Jardin haute Bretagne, And that is a park in Brittany. It's 25 acres. It is stellar. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and I was saying one of our great disappointments, and it's a beautiful place, and I don't want to discourage anybody from going there, were the gardens in Giverny, because they were so packed and so crowded, that if you, that I contrast that to this garden, and this garden, you can spend easily three or four hours between uh, formal rose gardens, Japanese gardens, ponds, um, a maze through bamboo trees. There's a beautiful restaurant that is there. It is open on Sundays. It's one of the few places that is there. And so when people come to visit, we spend a day at the garden. We spend a day in Laval. Mm. And it's gorgeous. Yes. Oh, we have a lot of remarkable gardens in France. And actually, that's what they're called. If you search for most remarkable gardens in France, you will find a bunch of them. And they're just as nice as Giverny, as you pointed out. With much less the crowd. With much less crowd, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, for touring to France, Annie, I, I, you, I, you probably will agree with this. Paris is beautiful, but it's not France any more than New York is exactly U- the U.S. Yeah. They're world-class cities, but they're not representative of the, of the country itself. And, and for people that want to come here, also explore areas to come into France besides um, – Besides Paris, because the airports, the regional airports in Rennes, Nantes, Bordeaux are much easier to fly in and out of. Mm-hmm. And they're an opportunity to see part of the country. Yeah, yeah. And so, you're, you're, you can't, yeah, you're, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> I know yeah. that uh, there's a lot more to France than Paris. And I'm, I've been trying to convince people to explore because it's gorgeous. I mean, not every place is gorgeous. Some places are eh, whatever, but a lot of places are absolutely fabulous. Even if nobody famous ever ate at that cafe, I assure <laughs> you, you don't need famous people to have eaten at that cafe for it to be good. <laughs> No, absolutely not. And when famous people ate there, they might have been a different chef anyways. You never know. Completely different. (laughs) Thank you so much, Sarah. That was an excellent, excellent conversation. Thank you for sharing your passion for 
for li- pursuing your dreams because that's exactly what I think you did. And uh, there are a lot of us who are a bit timid about that. So um, thank you for, for sharing the passion. Thank you for sharing the love of France. It's a, it's a wonderful country with incredibly kind people. And we're just happy to be here. Thank you for coming on the podcast. And uh, well, who knows? I might have you on again to talk about some other exp- you know, adventures you've had around there. Be safe. Take care. Thank you. Au revoir. Bye-bye. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing so. You can see them at patreon.com forward slash join us. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Join us, no spaces or dashes. Thank you all for supporting the show. Some of you for a long time now. You are wonderful. And a shout out this week to new patrons, Michael Brankenridge and Carrie Christine Hogan. Thank you so much for becoming patrons and making this podcast possible. I really wanted to finish up the write-up of the Galette des Rois and send it to my patrons for testing and enjoyment. But you know what? It's not quite ready. I made four Galette Brioche this week. Two worked perfectly and two went in the trash. (laughs) I will not send you a recipe that only works half of the time, so I'll keep trying. The problem is that when you make brioche... This is a problem with all brioche. You start like you're making bread, right? That's easy. (laughs) But then you add a whole cup of butter to your bread dough. And that's when the yeast can decide that it doesn't want to play anymore. And you end up with a flat, unedible mess. So... Yeah, there's got to be a trick to this, and I'm yet to uh, figure out how to make it work every time. Now, galette frangipane is easier to make. So I've made one, and it was good. I'll give it a few more tries and send the recipe next week. For the French tip of the week, I want to teach you how to ask something really, really important. And you'll know why in a second why it's so important. Especially when you're renting an apartment in France. You need to know how to ask L'appartement a-t-il la fibre optique? Is there fiber optics at the apartment? L'appartement a-t-il la fibre optique? Oui, 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 il vous faut la fibre optique. <laughs> I definitely have fiber optics on the mind this week. Also this week in French news, we have new restrictions in France with a nationwide curfew between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., Yeah, the new variants of the virus have our leaders worried that uh, the numbers could explode. So far, we're holding at between 20,000 and 30,000 new infections each day. That's kind of a high cruising altitude for a country like France. So far, it's manageable, but it could get out of control. So they've decided to uh, pretty much ask us to stay home more which is what works. The numbers of vaccines administered is accelerating, still not very fast, but speeding up. At this point, um, there are 877 vaccination centers in France. Anyone who is over 75 can get vaccinated, no questions asked. For younger folks, there is a ranking system. So, uh, for example, anyone undergoing chemotherapy or people on dialysis of any age can get the vaccine right away. Next up is people who work in the medical field. At first, uh, they've got to be over 55 and um, have uh, comorbidities, I guess is what you call them. And then they'll lower the age. Eventually, it'll get to me and my husband, but it'll probably take several weeks, possibly two, three months. I don't know. And for our daughter, who's young and healthy, it might be next summer. So, so unfortunately, patience is still the name of the game. And that's what happens when you let a pandemic get out of control. It, you know, it's really hard to put that genie back in the bottle, uh, unfortunately. And uh, it's hard for all the countries that, uh, uh, that didn't do a great job at handling it at, right at first. And I think that includes France. This week, I read a book set in Saint-Rémy-de-Provence, a lovely little uh, town that I visited a few, a couple times, maybe three times, I don't remember. Um, so the book is called Murder in Saint-Rémy, and it's by Susan Kierman-Lewis. 
It was a fine murder mystery as far as murder mysteries are concerned. But really, if you change place names and a few of the people names, the story could be in Italy or in Spain or on the moon because it really has nothing to do with life in France. It's like, um, you know, the, the author tells you several times that Saint-Rémy is the most beautiful village in France. And it gets annoying because Saint-Rémy is not even a village. It's a medium-sized town, really. Also, the book doesn't have anything to do with police work in France because it's English and American protagonists doing all the investigating, right? So, it, I mean, it's not a bad novel, you know, it was fine, but it won't make it to my list of faves on Amazon because it's not French enough to, you know, to qualify. And I've also started on a history book in English. I tried to read most history books in French, but this one's in English. It's about the French Revolution. And I think I'm only 20% into it, right? But I think it'll make the list because so far it's really good. It does a good job at uh, summarizing the French Revolution. So I'll tell you more next week about that. And one very exciting thing happened for me this week. And uh, I mentioned on a previous episode that my village now has fiber optics, but it runs under the street, not uh, into people's houses, right? So the utility company will run it down the street, but then it's your job to bring it from the street to your house, right? And um, a guy from the the company... uh, a provider, uh, came to our house a few weeks ago. And that's when I taught you the expression, c'est des manchots, <laughs> meaning they're all thumbs, because they were standing right on the box that said France Telecom and didn't see it. But they saw it, but then they tried to run a cable through the, the ducts underground and it wasn't working. We're not the only people with this predicament. Everybody in the village is trying to get connected to fiber right now. And um, it's for some of us, it's a bit more difficult than others, especially people who are on a private drive like we are. Because typically, phone and fiber optics follow the same path. You've got to find the phone box that's in the ground that serves your house, right? And then there's ducts that run that cable into your house. Well, you can... Put your fiber optics in the same ducts, but you got to find the ducts first. So we tried, you know, but, and it wasn't working. So I did something that is very French and that I recommend any of you who live in France or want to live in France, remember. What works in France is talking to people. So walking around with my dogs, I saw some guys who were running utilities in big ducks, right? They, they were doing this for a big company. It was from Bouygues. Uh, and they were digging up the sidewalk and all of that in the next village over. So I talked to them and I explained my predicament to three different people. And one of them was happy to come to my house the next day, he said, so he could see if he could sort us out. And he did come the next day and couldn't, it wasn't working right. He didn't have the right tools. So he said, I'll come, he'd come back. And then he did. It took him a few tries. He came and went a few times because every time he needed something different, but at least he was a professional. He was used to doing this sort of work and he knew what tools he needed to get there, you know, and he did. <laughs> so it's, I'm very, very excited that now we have a thread that runs between the street all the way into our garage. So that means that they can pull a cable from the street all the way into our garage. I was, I wasn't sure. So I had asked this guy to give me a bid, right? And he shrugged and said, I don't know, we'll see. And and I thought, okay, either he's not taking this seriously or he has no idea how long it's going to take. So he doesn't want to give me an idea of cost, right? But it was something different still. He just... When I when he was done and I said, so how much do I owe you? He just shrugged again and he said, oh, whatever you'd like. And I was like, oh, what what do you do with that? How much did I give him? So I, you know, I eyeballed it. He, he spent about three hours. Um, I decided to be generous with him. And he, I when I handed the money to him, I asked, is that 
does that cover it? Is that good enough? And he gave me a big smile and says, yes, thank you. So that's how things work in France. You know, my husband, he thought, oh, maybe this guy is going to ask us for lots of money <laughs> in the end. And we, but that's that, the opposite was happening. He was mostly doing this to be helpful because I asked him for help. And, you know, if I had given him 50 bucks, he would have been okay with it, I think. Um, I gave him more than, quite a bit more than that. But, it, you know, he just wanted to be helpful. And he didn't see this as a money-grabbing opportunity. And remember that French people will do a lot for you, but you have to ask for help and you have to be friendly. And, you know, especially at a time like now when we're all cooped up in our houses and, uh, you know, it's, it's from house to work, back to the house and back to work. And there's no very little opportunity for uh, entertainment. And I'm sure it's this, exactly the same for you, wherever you live in the world. So it's, it's really important to be, uh, you know, be friendly. Uh, that's, that's what I think anyway. <laughs> so we're ready for the fiber optics guys to come back and set us up and then watch out world. I'll be uploading lots of silly videos of France to YouTube <laughs> because the reason why I wasn't doing that is because it would just take hours for three minute videos. It would take me two hours to upload it. And so now it's going to be a lot easier. Now, I want you to know that I'm actually running out of trip reports. So if you would like to share your experiences in France, email Annie at joinusinfrance.com. I will be very happy to talk to you about doing a possible uh, episode with you. And as always, if you enjoy the show, introduce a friend to the podcast and show them how to listen. Next week on the podcast, an episode with Elise about the Marais Poitevin which is another place that you might not have heard of. It's nicknamed the Green Venice. It's a beautiful, beautiful part of France that both Elise and I have visited, so we wanted to tell you about it. Send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you are well. I hope you're not too dispirited by what's happening, uh, especially in the U.S. right now. <sighs> deep breath, deep breath. And please join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. The Join Us in France travel podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2021 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.